Donnie, you're out of your element. So there was a Lady Gaga concert this weekend. And some sort of football game too, I guess, I don't know. Anyway, apparently a lot of people were grateful for the brief break in politics. There's been some suggestions that Gaga was barred from making political statements. And that's something I want to address in today's broadside. Well, that and what appears to be a lack of understanding among politicians, on the right in particular, about musical artistry. Because let's be honest, just having Lady Gaga perform at your hyper-macho sporting event in Texas is already a political statement before she sings a single note. Gaga is, not to put too fine a point on it, a huge gay icon. A voice for the LGBT community that is probably currently unmatched. Some might point out that she opened her performance with Red State, Red Meat classic, God Bless America. Then medleyed into, This Land is Your Land. While she didn't specifically sing them, There exists within that Arlo Guthrie song a pair of lines that read, quote, As I went walking, I saw a sign there, and on the sign it said no trespassing. And on the other side it didn't say nothing, that side was made for you and me. In the shadow of the steeple, I saw my people. By the relief office, I seen my people, as they stood there hungry, I stood there asking, Is this land made for you and me? A link to the full lyrics will be in the show notes. She then follows with a piece of the Pledge of Allegiance. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. After her song Poker Face, she switches into Born This Way, an anthem for literally everyone who was ever considered different or other. If you're somehow unfamiliar with the song, I'd recommend you check it out and pay particular attention to the bridge. We'll have a link to the lyrics. I can't speak to whether these were deliberate choices on Gaga's part to slide some commentary into her performance, but it would not surprise me if she did. It also doesn't surprise me that most commentators, particularly on the right, didn't seem to notice. But that shouldn't surprise us, because since at least the 80s, the Republican Party in particular has shown a distinct lack of understanding about artist messages in music. It's not just that artists tend to be politically opposed to the candidates, or that the candidates often use the music without permission, but that the candidates, or whomever picks the music, doesn't understand the actual songs. Whenever I've talked about this subject, the first and probably biggest example that comes to mind is Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA, which is routinely chosen for Republican presidential campaigns. However, none of them seem aware that the song's not about American exceptionalism, but rather a broken political system that destroyed the blue-collar working class by grinding them in the cogs of the military-industrial complex. Springsteen is writing about an America he loves, but it's not the one the Republicans were promoting in the 80s. It was the America they were creating. If you have any doubt, check out the video link in the show notes. There was a similar issue when Republicans used John Mellencamp's Pink Houses, both in the 80s and the 2000s. The song's about the failure of the American dream. It's about mediocrity and conformity. Mellencamp himself has called it anti-American. Sarah Palin, former presidential candidate and reality show star, gets a pair of mentions because of her use of Hart's Barracuda, which was apparently Palin's high school sports nickname. Palin didn't seem to know the song was about Hart's conflict with a record label that had attempted to use Anna Nancy Wilson's sexuality as a publicity stunt. She also pissed off Gretchen Peters, who wrote the song Independence Day, which was recorded by Martina McBride, because the McCain-Palin campaign was, quote, using a song about an abused woman, unquote, to promote Palin, a candidate who would, quote, set women's rights back decades, unquote. Paul Ryan, current Speaker of the House, earned the ire of Rage Against the Machine by referencing them as one of his favorite bands. Tom Morello's response fills an article in Rolling Stone, but the highlight is probably, quote, I wonder what Ryan's favorite Rage song is. Is it the one where we condemn the genocide of Native Americans? The one lambasting American imperialism? Our cover of Fuck the Police? Or is it the one where we call on the people to seize the means of production? So many excellent choices to jam out to at young Republican meetings, end quote. The list is endless, but there's a big helping in a Rolling Stone article that I've linked in the show notes, which brings me back to the current administration. Trump was fond of using Neil Young's Rockin' in the Free World, apparently without any interest in or acknowledgement of the singer's politics or that he's Canadian. 
by American and hire American. He also used Queen's We Are the Champions, like Pat Buchanan and Mitt Romney before him, despite the fact that Queen's lead singer died of pneumonia complicated by AIDS, and they represent the party of early AIDS denial, as well as the party of efforts to stop abortion that mostly inhibit contraception accessibility, particularly in Africa. Aside from that, no one requested nor received permission to use the song because Queen has a policy of not allowing their songs to be used for political campaigns. Trump used the song anyway. Why is any of this important? Well, there's two reasons. One, it's a reminder that despite their populist rhetoric, the right is out of touch with the American people, not only in their politics, but in their basic comprehension of human language. Two, music is a language, and it can spread a message overtly or subtly, and that makes it a powerful weapon against authority whether the anti-war protest anthems of the 60s and 70s or the Rock Against Bush compilations of the 2000s, because it unifies and gives people a voice. We regularly talk on this show about ways we can organize, mobilize, and protest, and sometimes it feels a little nuts and bolts. Call, write, meet up, etc. So I offer you this suggestion. Make music. Write. Play. Sing. Dance. Be a voice. If you, like me, either lack the music gene or wouldn't be caught dead in front of an audience, then help connect people who can or who will. Organize events. Promote them. Share the music. Turn your solo voice into a chorus. The easiest way to make the powerful listen is to make them want to listen, to capture their ear with a melody, a hook, a chorus, a beat. Get them to spread their message because they're infected by it, even or especially because they don't even understand it. The sleep of reason brings forth monsters. I'm a whiner and I keep whining and whining until I win. Maybe somebody will rise up. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. Welcome to Swing State, an aggressive, progressive, critical, and political podcast from the middle of the Midwest. I'm the Wayne. I'm AJ. This is episode eight. Welcome back to Swing State, where we're just as surprised as you are that America isn't already a nuclear wasteland. But it's not like Trump hasn't been trying. According to a USA Today article, China and Iran, two countries, quote, that top President Trump's enemies list, are pushing back against his tough talk this week with showy and provocative military drills, end quote. So, just in case you thought Trump actually knew what he was doing, it turns out he doesn't. And on that note, AJ has a long list of additional shit that he and his aides don't seem to know anything about. Yeah, it is a pretty expansive list. Um, This week uh, in the New York Times on February 5th, there was an article that came out that was titled Trump and Staff Rethink Tactics After Stumbles. So, I mean, it's a pretty generic headline, um, but this article is definitely worth a read. We'll put a link down in the show notes. A couple of weeks ago, we had an extended football analogy where we talked about what happens when you have an administration that's run by a, well, a buffoon, I guess is one way to put it. It doesn't necessarily work out so well. And here we have some of the first inklings that uh, it ain't working out so well in Trump land either, despite what you may hear on Fox. So here we go. President Trump loves to set the day's narrative at dawn, but the deeper story of his White House is best told at night. Aides confer in the dark because they cannot figure out how to operate the light switches in the cabinet room. I'm sorry, wait. Could you go back and repeat that? Aides confer in the dark because they cannot figure out how to operate the light switches in the cabinet room. Visitors conclude their meetings and then wander around testing doorknobs until finding the one that leads to an exit. In a darkened, mostly empty West Wing, Mr. Trump's provocative chief strategist, Stephen K. Bannon, finishes another 16-hour day planning new lines of attack. Usually around 6.30 p.m. or sometimes later, Mr. Trump retires upstairs to the residence to recharge, vent, and intermittently use Twitter. With his wife, Melania, and young son, Barron, staying in New York, he is almost always by himself, sometimes in the protective presence of his imposing longtime aide and former security chief Keith Schiller. When Mr. Trump is not watching television in his bathrobe or on his phone reaching out to old campaign hands and advisors, he will sometimes set off to explore the unfamiliar surroundings of his new home. During his first two dizzying weeks in office, 
Mr. Trump, an outsider president working with a surprisingly small crew of no more than a half dozen empowered aides with virtually no familiarity with the workings of the White House or federal government, sent shockwaves at home and overseas with a succession of executive orders designed to fulfill campaign promises and taunt foreign leaders. So there's the first part of the article. We'll get down into something else a little bit later that, that popped up from it. But this should come as a surprise to no one. A- absolutely no one. I mean, this is we have been warning about this for months. We've been talking about how Donald Trump, he has no experience whatsoever in the public sector. I usually put it more bluntly. I usually say he just doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. But yeah, if you want to be nice about it, he lacks experience. But one of the things in that, there's a there's a comment later in the article that sort of caught me off guard because I sort of knew it in one sense, but but didn't really think about it. To quote briefly, before he was ousted in November as transition chief, Governor Chris Christie of New Jersey, the Trump advisor with the most government experience. His most experienced advisor was Governor Chris Christie, and he cut him loose. He really doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, yeah, it's funny. They can't figure out the lights, and they can't figure out which doors. And Okay, sure. It's a new house. Uh, it took me a while to figure out what some of the switches did in my house, too. But for fuck's sake, they they don't know what they're doing about anything. It, it ain't just the light switches. The executive order of the Muslim ban, which we covered last week, subsequently after we covered the Muslim ban, saying it was a Muslim ban and that it would face mounting legal challenges, it in fact did face mounting legal challenges because a judge in Washington... Oh, he's a liberal. <laughs> yeah, the, the liberal Bush appointee, he basically struck down several sections of the law. The judge just goes through and basically, he, uh, this, this provision, nope. This provision, nope. Check, check, check check, check, until eventually the thing has no teeth. Uh, There will be an upcoming hearing, but it's just, it's symptomatic of what is in this article. When you have a so-called president, I guess, who doesn't actually know what he's doing, and he doesn't have anybody around him who's much more informed than he is, you get the following, which is the next part of the article. Cloistered in the White House, he now has little access to his fans and supporters, an important source of feedback and validation, and feels increasingly pinched by the pressures of the job and the constant presence of protests, one of the reasons he was forced to scrap a planned trip to Milwaukee last week. For a sense of what is happening outside, he watches cable, both at night and during the day, too much in the eyes of some aides, often offering a bitter play-by-play of critics like CNN's Don Lemon. Until the past few days, Mr. Trump was telling friends and advisors that he believed the opening stages of his presidency were going well. Did you hear that? This guy thinks it's been terrible, Mr. Trump said mockingly to other aides when one dissenting view was voiced last week during a West Wing meeting. Wait, he he spends hours watching CNN? Yeah, I thought it was fake news, right? Why would you watch fake news? Well, I mean, I guess guys like right wing watch watch the lunatics just to see what they're saying, but (laughs) but I can't imagine... Oh, Jesus Christ. You don't get to just say it's it's fake news and, and, and try and dismiss it as irrelevant and then turn right back around and obsess over the shit that they're saying. That's the behavior of somebody with like some sort of bizarre anxiety issue. Obviously, I'm not a medical professional. But that's somebody seeking validation, even if it's from somebody they don't have any respect for. Is that what you wanted to... In a president? Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, when we talk about the president of the United States, often one of the words that comes up in relation to the discussion is leadership. Do you think George Washington was sitting around the fire reading the newspapers every day, trying to convince himself that the Revolutionary War was going all right when, in fact, his army was, you know, half starved to death? This is just, this is not the behavior of somebody with leadership potential. And, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the first time that a source newspaper has printed that Donald Trump doesn't do fuck all but watch TV all day damn day. That's what his presidency is. He watches TV, gets irritated, and tweets. And then meanwhile, he signs shit, which he doesn't even know what's in it most of the time. I mean, he's he's a TV executive. So the fact that he watches TV and that's his primary method of really doing anything sort of makes sense. Because I think that's the thing that we don't really pay enough attention to. I mean, he gets a passing comment now and again. At the end of the day, he's a fucking TV producer. That's, well, actually, it pretty much is an example of, of what Trump does, which is make a decision and tell people to make that shit happen. It doesn't matter how. It doesn't matter if it makes any sense. It, as evidenced by the, the Muslim ban and several of his other executive orders, it also doesn't matter if it's fucking legal. And I don't mean just statutorily legal. I mean constitutionally legal. None of that matters to him. He just has promises he's made that he's hurrying like hell to make 
I don't know if it's because he knows he's going to be out soon or if he just is trying to hustle through them so he can get back and watch TV and then bitch about Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is one of the questions I've wanted to have a reporter ask him for months and months now, actually basically since he ran. I want a reporter to sit down across from him and say, Mr. Trump, could you enumerate the checks and balances system that we have within the Constitution and what the different responsibilities of the executive, judicial, and legislative branches are? I think you would get a deer in the headlights, frozen, cold cock, stupid glare out of the guy, and he might start crying on national TV. It would be like handing him a passage of Shakespeare and ask him to read it out loud, because I don't think he can read probably either. It just exposed the guy through questions. That's that's all you have to do. If you want to if you want to get famous on TV and get some ratings, just ask him a detailed question about the Constitution and watch him try and backflip out of it. That's actually a good strategy for a couple of reasons. One of them is, you know for a fact, he's just not going to be able to do it. If you ask him pointed questions, he's not going to be able to answer them. But two, there's no way of bullshitting your way around not knowing what the fuck you're talking about. Because he's just going to sit there like, uh... Or he's gonna he's gonna make mouth noises like he does about America <laughs> and and great and all of that shit. But he can't answer pointed questions. For fuck's sake, I just watched part of his interview with O'Reilly, the 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 pre Super Bowl interview. He doesn't really address much of anything O'Reilly says directly. And when he does, the answer is kind of frightening because he talks about respecting Putin. When O'Reilly responds that Putin is literally a killer, Trump's response is to then question America and its innocence. Now, I don't know about you, but if a Democrat had said anything like that, that doubted the integrity of the United States, they'd have been fucking strung up. They'd have been tarred and feathered. The president of the United States, and I'm choking every time I say that, actually disparaged America on television before the fucking Super Bowl, which is like the biggest church service of patriotism around, and nobody blinks. Nobody, even O'Reilly, who seems sort of stunned by it, just sort of lets it go. The fact that he would try and, and paint an equivalency between a Russian despot and the United States government. Well, I mean, okay, look, as a liberal who has an appreciation of our checkered past in the United States, to a certain extent, my, my, I'm not over bothered by his comments. Except one thing that we don't have is a whole lot of instances of Barack Obama, say, poisoning journalists he happened to disagree with, or intimidating them, or having a CIA, which is basically just the extension of the White House, which goes around targeting American citizens for for nothing more than dissent, you know, not an actual crime, dissent. The equivocation is absurd, and I cannot believe that these so-called conservatives are going to go about calling themselves that anymore. These people have fled every single moral proposition they claim to hold in the course of a year. Conservatism has wiped itself out bending over to genuflect in front of the altar of power for Donald fucking Trump, a two-bit loser. It's just fucking sad. But if there is one good piece of information in this article that, you know, Dumbo was in his bathrobe watching TV all day, it's that it's the line right here where he feels increasingly pinched by the pressures of the job and the constant presence of protests. So if you're listening to our show and you consider yourself among the resistance, give yourself a round of applause. You are seriously getting to this guy. These protests are getting to the guy because he can't go play fucking golf without 200 people showing up with signs and yelling at him because he sucks at his fucking job because like the article says, he doesn't know anything about his fucking job. Keep it up. Yes. Keep it up. Please. Every fucking day, tweet this moron. Every day, get online and, and find some other protest or some march, some rally, some political meetup. Go to something. Get involved. The more people that are involved and the more we can sustain this energy, the better off we're going to be. And this is having real, immediate, short-term impact, even yes. maybe more than I thought it would have. I was actually sort of surprised by that because the right's response to protests is generally to just dismiss them outright. And Trump will say that type of thing. He will sort of dismiss them outright but it obviously wears on him and we talked last time about a thousand cuts that that's what it's going to take tweet him daily dig at him daily that's how he communicates he watches tv and he's on twitter well we can't get on tv except when we're in a giant fucking crowd of people but you can get on twitter anybody can do it you don't have to say anything particularly terrible he's so thin-skinned 
You can just make passing references to his failure. Look, in Trump's world, because he is an authoritarian who has an authoritarian's worldview, simply the act of dissent itself is a kind of betrayal. Disagreement is the same thing as betrayal in Trump's mind. If he has a position and you have the opposite position, that makes you an enemy. It could be about whether or not he likes salt on steak. It doesn't matter because he has to be right. He has to be the one giving the orders, setting the tone. And if anybody is not on board with that, well, he, he literally cannot handle it. I've never, ever, ever seen a person rise this high, both in the, what he said, the echelons of fame and political power, and be so fucking thin-skinned. How the hell did he get this job? I mean, you'd think by now he would have fucking crawled into a safe space and died, because the presidency is a white-hot lightning rod of criticism. Look at what Hillary had to put up with just on the campaign trail. Do you think it would have been any easier if she'd have been in the White House? Oh, and guess who never, ever, ever, ever once bitched about people being mean to her? Her. Oh wait, was that was was that Hillary? I think it was Hillary Clinton. In fact, I think what she said was, you know, all of these things, you just take them in stride and they fall to the side and you move forward. Those are basically her words. I, we're we're kind of off script here, but I, I'm still just amazed to this day that this guy was elected with the ridiculous bullshit notion that he was a tough guy, that he was going to bring strength and masculinity to America. Hillary Clinton had more balls than Donald Trump ever did. Give me a fucking break. This guy is a crybaby loser who doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm sorry if you're fo if you're a follower of this guy. Look, I'm sorry you got hooked up with him. It happens to people. Okay, sometimes you get taken in. It ha it's happened to me. It's happened to pretty much everybody Dude, I know. We, we've all had that bad boyfriend or girlfriend. Yeah. Okay, it, it happens. We get it. But you know what? You can break up with them. Yeah. Guys, if you're a Trump supporter, please just never feel the need to defend this. There's no reason for you to speak up for it. It's, it's just too embarrassing and too obvious to anybody who knows what they're talking about for you to really be able to get away successfully defending his behavior so far. But there's really no need to. You know, just l let it go. AJ, and I, well, me especially, I've been really hard on the people that are Trump supporters. You know, I've said probably some pretty awful shit about you both on here and, and not. But but here's the thing. If you really do regret the decision, if you really do realize you got taken in, it's okay. You don't have to tell us. You don't have to prostrate yourself before us and say, okay, yeah, I fucked up. Just stop supporting him. Stop pretending that you have to do these things. Stop pretending that you have to look at the Muslim ban as anything other than Muslim ban. Stop pretending that you have to look at an unqualified idiot like Betsy DeVos as a legitimate candidate for a secretarial position. It's okay. Just stop. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to switch sides. You don't have to go after them. There's plenty of us doing that. Just stop for your own sake. Just stop. If you want a good enough reason, if, if what we're saying here is just not reaching you, how about this one? You guys, he ran against Hillary Clinton, and one of his main arguments was, was that she was dug into Goldman Sachs like a tick and to Wall Street. Well, come to find out, in his first two fucking weeks in office, Donald Trump has not only installed Goldman Sachs in the Treasury Department again, which is where they were when the fucking 2008 Great Recession began. He's got at least three members of Goldman Sachs working in some capacity for his, for his administration, and he's signing executive orders going after Dodd-Frank. You've been fleeced. You've been had. There is no way somebody could pretend to be against Wall Street and for the interests of the common man and then turn around and install Wall Street in the Treasury Department and give them their wish list of the regulations that they would like slashed because it benefits their bottom line. Lines. Do you think anything good is going to happen to your wallet because of these actions? Do you think that he had you in mind when he was thinking about this? Do you think he has you in mind when he's talking about his friends that have beautiful businesses that can't get a loan? He's talking about his rich friends because those are the only friends he has, assuming they're even really his friends. It's pretty clear that if you voted for Donald Trump, at least it's clear to anyone who is not over-invested in his campaign turned presidency. It's clear to anyone who is outside of that little bubble that you've been fleeced. And as a liberal, as a progressive, I'm not necessarily dancing or happy that you've been fleeced. That doesn't do me any fucking good no. to have half the country get ripped off because I'm right there with you whether I voted for him or not. What matters to me now is that you recognize it and that we can return in this country to a time of intellectual honesty and curiosity again because this shit show that we've got now is just fucking killing me. And I believe that um, we've come horribly off track uh, in the years uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union and we're starting... Uh, now in the 21st century, which I believe strongly is a crisis both of our church, a crisis of our faith, a crisis of the West, and a crisis of capitalism. Uh, and uh, we're at the very beginning stages 
of a very brutal and bloody conflict of which if the people in this room and the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant, to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting, uh, that we will literally eradicate everything that we've been bequeathed over the last uh, 2,000 to 2,500 years. One of the things that I think is sort of unavoidable when we're talking about Trump, particularly if we're talking about his thin skin and his machismo and basically what's going on, is the puppeteer with his hand up Trump's ass, which is Steve Bannon. You heard in the clip before his whole bit about bloody war. And I think if you've ever seen any of the things he's written or any of the things associated with him on his uh, Breitbart website, aside from becoming a, a home for white nationalism, I really hate that phrase because it, it seems easier to say Nazi. But anyway, it's become a haven for white nationalism, but... But Bannon seems obsessed with war, and it really doesn't seem to matter with whom. According to this Salon article, quote, According to multiple sources, Bannon is obsessed with war. His ex-writing partner of 20 years says he tended to focus on military battles. His Bible was the art of war. An ex-Breitbart staffer reportedly told the Daily Beast that Bannon, quote, always spoke in terms of aggression. It was always on the attack, double down, macho stuff. Steve has an obsession with testosterone, end quote. This is the guy who's running the guy who's making all of the decisions. Recently, Trump authorized a mission into Yemen, a decision he apparently made basically at the dinner table without really consulting anybody. And the end result was one of the SEAL team were killed. A multi-million dollar plane was intentionally destroyed. And numerous civilians, including children, were killed. Now, the first defense I've heard is that, well, this was originally Obama's plan. Sure, okay. Aside from the fact that you've pretty much purged everything else from Obama, except for when he needs a scapegoat, fine, whatever. Trump is the current president, which means he has newer, more accurate information and intelligence, and he made this decision. He doesn't get to blame it on Obama. He's the one that authorized the raid. The end result was a bunch of people ended up dead, and at best, what I've heard is we may have gotten some intelligence from it. Oh, there was one other thing, and that was propaganda for the extremist Muslims, because the guy that they went there to get, they missed. And he's made sure to let everybody in the fucking world know that America missed. Now, I have not served in the military. I am ineligible for service for a variety of physical issues that go well beyond bone spurs. But I was a military brat. I did travel around two foreign countries and other states based on where one of my parents was stationed. It, <laughs> I, I, this does not make me an expert, but it gives me a better understanding of what making decisions like this means. It means that maybe somebody's dad doesn't come home. It means maybe somebody's mom doesn't come home. It means maybe one of those guys comes home and he's the guy who shot an eight-year-old. These are decisions that are not only matters of life and death. They are matters of mental health. They are matters that have an impact beyond just who died and who didn't. But I'm good at war. I've had a lot of wars of my own. I'm really good at war. I love war in a certain way. Trump stood up in front of other grown men and said this as though it was supposed to be some kind of an admirable characteristic, uh, which again, this is one of the things that I've noticed about Donald Trump is that he is very much at odds with traditional American values and sort of our cultural norms because one of the things that if, if you are actually interested in, in the history of warfare or military history or you like the genre of movies and, and novels that have grown up around you know, different military exploits, one of the things that you continuously run into is the idiot greenhorn character that shows up on the battlefield all excited and raring to go. Oh boy, I can't wait to shoot me some crowds. This is the best day of my life. Then he gets an actual taste of war and he finds out the truth about it, which is that it's fucking horrible and there's not one redeeming thing about it and only an insane person would actually wish to cause another one to happen. This is something that Donald Trump and Steve Bannon I don't think really appreciate. They remind me they, they remind me a lot of these. There was an article that uh, Luann and I both read uh, several several months ago. It was about the uh, border militias that you know kind of spring up down in Texas. Uh, there was a huge uptick of these groups, these you know so-called paramilitary groups in places like Texas and along the border that basically they get together and play dress up, they bring their AR-15s and their MREs, and they sit around in the tent watching Gladiator all day, you know, sort of pretending that they're that they're GI Joe. This is not masculinity. So it's one of those 
characteristics that you can easily detect somebody who's full of shit is when they have these opinions about war and about violence that are just very cavalier, very stupid, very childish, and of course that fits right in with Trump's personality in general. But it's, it's something that I think uh, the women of the country, and particularly the women in their lives, probably instantly see through, straight to the frail little heart of their masculinity, that ego which is constantly under threat by the slightest hint of criticism at the same time that they're beating their chest about wanting to you know, go to war or watch a military parade or whatever the fuck they're trying to do to make themselves feel like they're in the real man's military. And here's one of the things about... Bannon's obsession with Sun Tzu, if if the article is accurate. One of the lessons in the art of war is that the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. That is probably the best message within, oddly enough, a message about warfare. The best way to win is to do it without fighting, without risking yourself, without risking your allies, without risking your resources. This is the guy that Trump has placed on the National Security Council, Steve Bannon. He's going to be replacing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a permanent member of the National Security Council. The other guy will just get a phone call when he's needed. Under what circumstance would Steve fucking Bannon's opinion ever be necessary on a matter of national security? He ran a fucking website. When he, Steve Bannon, has decided it is. There's an independent article that mentions this, but really it pops up in a variety of places. But the headline to the independent article sort of sums it up, which is, quote, Donald Trump didn't realize he promoted Steve Bannon to National Security Council when he signed order, end quote. He didn't fucking know what he signed. I read another article which said basically the same thing, and it went on to say that Trump was actually pretty miffed about it. He's more pissed about that than he is about the judges and the Muslim ban, that Steve Bannon somehow managed to wriggle his way into a position of, of high importance on national security without Trump being briefed, which is amazing because these executive orders aren't even that long. You'd think he'd take the time to read them, maybe. Yeah, they're a page or two. I mean, you can find them anywhere. The independent article actually reinforces what you said. It specifically has a quote that said, quote, Mr. Bannon has no experience in government or in foreign policy, end quote. Trump doesn't know what he's doing, and he put a guy in charge who sure loves warfare. Oh, yeah, so great. So we got the guy that likes to sit around and watch Gladiator all day. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's fucking fantastic. I mean, wonderful. Well, you know, how, how could we do any better than this in the United States of America? You know, the most elite military in the history of civilization. We can we, we have any numerable one of thousands of advisors you could choose for this role who would at least be competent. But instead, we get Mr. Breitbart, a white nationalist sewer, is going to be representing you. That is to say, we the people. We are going to be represented by this man. Our, our national security is going to be, in some sense, in his hands. And from all of the information that I can glean from reports, he is really the top advisor in the Trump administration. He's the one, if he's not the puppet master, he's one of the only ones that consistently has Trump's ear. The director of national intelligence, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These are the people that are getting bumped out of the way to be replaced by Steve Bannon. Now, they're going to hang on to them, apparently, to refer to them when they have, quote, issues pertaining to their responsibilities and expertise are to be discussed, end quote. Basically, we're going to give them no power, but when we don't know what the fuck to do, we're going to ask them for help. Yeah, it's don't worry, guys. Steve's got it. We'll call you when we need you because he seems enamored with the idea of going to war because, of course, his ghoulish ass will not be the one going to the front line. No, and that's that's that tends to be the way it usually works. The guys who are the most excited about the possibility of warfare are the ones who don't have to deal with it and who don't have to deal with the consequences because, as evidenced thus far, they don't know what they're doing and they don't give a shit about anybody else who has to deal with this stuff. And let's not forget, we're still really technically in the middle of a pair of wars yet. We're still in Iraq. We're still in Afghanistan. Well, really, we're scattered throughout the Middle East. We already have enough war going on. We've got more war going on than we need as it is. We certainly don't need more of it, particularly if you're doing things like poking North Korea in the eye or making disparaging comments to fucking China. Because let's be honest, military power, no military power, they have way more bodies to throw at us than we have to throw at them. And they also have missiles. Well, and how about this stupid Muslim ban, which is across the Muslim world perceived as a Muslim ban because that's what it is. And it's plain in the text. If you simply read it, you're fomenting the conditions under which terror attacks followed by a war 
would occur. And it's done in such a way that I have a hard time not seeing it as either, it may be not deliberate is the right word, but it is born out of a ridiculous mentality towards war and military intervention, which is a childish, chest-beating, swaggering, douchebaggy version of it, instead of the real one, which is what you see at the VA every day. When our veterans are coming back from Iraq and they can't sleep at night, and any time a car backfires, they're fucking hitting the deck for the rest of their lives. I don't even think they consider those things because they're so wrapped up in the fantasy world of American exceptionalism and the American military and the sort of the cult of praising the military that we have that they don't they don't look past that to the actual effects on actual soldiers to say nothing of the countries that would be involved in our potential wars. They don't think about any of that. When they do think about it, what they think is, we don't want those people coming here. Why are there refugees? Because their country's being blown to shit, okay? It doesn't matter that we have anything to do with blowing their country to shit. We don't want to let them in here. Well, if they weren't radicalized before, they're certainly going to be now. Like you, I'm willing to give them the benefit of a doubt that this isn't deliberate. Like, they're actually like, yeah, we're going to go ahead and start a war with Islam. But it's kind of hard not to look at it that way, at least a little bit, particularly when you're dealing with Bannon. I mean, there's a Salon article actually entitled, Six Things Steve Bannon Has Declared War On. And it's sort of flippant, but it's not entirely, because number one is everything. All right, sure, fine, whatever. Two, Islam. Yeah, no question. I think if you've read anything on Breitbart, if you've even made a passing glance at Breitbart, you've seen that. Three, China, of course, because they're one of the few big remaining enemies in quotation marks that we have, despite how closely linked our economies are to China each China wants a war with the United States like they want an outbreak of smallpox. It's ridiculous. It, yeah. It's absurd. And again, Donald Trump has run on his, his success as a businessman, but doesn't seem to recognize or acknowledge China's business partner. I mean, there's no other way around it. Oh, four, more Islam. Five, the free press. Six, the Middle East, quote, which he uses as a stand-in for Islam, end quote. At the end of the day, the guy running the show, and, and let's be honest, Steve Bannon is running the show because Trump didn't even know that he had signed an order putting Bannon in a position of power. Which is just unfucking believable Every time I hear it, I'm like, well, how, how is that alone not sufficient for some kind of reprimand or public shame for the president? If you just put somebody on the, on the National Security Council by accident, ooh, oh, oh, holy shit, whoops, I just put a nationalist on the fucking <laughs> Security Council. Whoopsie daisy. At the very least, how do you just... Not look like a fucking idiot. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall this in Barack Obama's administration where, you know, oh shit, I just, I just hired somebody I didn't mean to. I don't remember that happening. Actually, I really don't remember that happening. I mean, obviously, I don't know everything about every fucking president, but I don't remember even the really shitty presidents accidentally doing something stupid like that. I mean, even George Bush at least had been told why it was he was doing a certain thing. Trump doesn't seem to have any idea. At the end of the day, we have, for better or worse, whether you want to call him that or not, a fucking Nazi in charge of our Security Council. And he's the same guy who's essentially doing everything he can through Donald Trump to poke Islam in the eye. And if you remember, it was Steve Bannon who pushed for the green card ban when the illegal unconstitutional Muslim ban was first forwarded. That was that was his idea. So you're talking about the probably the worst person in the administration, which is, I think, as John, as John Cleese said, it's kind of like the crew of a pirate ship. Well, he is the first mate and the rottenest scoundrel of them all, and he is actually seeming to increase his power by the day. Because I can't stress this enough. Donald Trump accidentally put him in that position. I'm going to say it one more time, just because it still amazes me. He accidentally put him in that position. He signed a fucking executive order that he apparently didn't even read. Or if he did, he didn't understand. This is the guy barely half of you put in charge of our country. I'm going to say it one more time because I still can't fucking believe it. He accidentally put him in charge of our representation at the Security Council. This is a guy, I mean, they're not a big fan of the United Nations. They love them some war. They like military parades. Trump uh, actually requested the military parade for his inauguration but unfortunately the roads wouldn't handle the tanks guys what we're doing here is we're just trying to paint you a picture because you know in a year a month a week tomorrow if you start to hear a drum beat for war uh, around capitol hill particularly coming out of the trump administration whether it's iran or some other middle eastern country or you know some military exercise that goes awry all we're waiting for now is the pretense under which a war could begin and in my mind i have no i have no serious doubt that the administration would at least be 
amenable to that idea. I don't know if they would flat out contrive to make it happen, but I think that if we did have a terrorist attack on our soil, which is increasingly likely now thanks to the idiotic Muslim ban, I think that that would be used as an excuse for Mr. I Love War and his puppet master whose hand is rammed so far up his ass that he's pretty much working his mouth like a puppet. They would use this as a as a way to get us into one for no other reason than the fact that they enjoy the idea of it. And that concerns me, and it should startle you that a person like Steve Bannon has the power that he does in what appears to be accidental circumstances. So here's the thing. There's a good chance of war is coming, whether we like it or not. Certainly, things are being put in motion that would suggest that, as you put it, they're amenable to the idea, that it would certainly not bother them a bit if we were to go to war. I don't even think they'll have to manufacture it. None of this conspiracy 911 is an inside job, all that bullshit. It's not going to be necessary. You're going to have another Reichstag fire, and somebody's just going to go, oh, look, it's X group. Let's go. So you have to tell them no. The thing we keep forgetting is that as much power as these guys wield, and as much as they just like swinging their dicks around, they're still technically public servants. They're your employees. They're your temporary employees. When you see this shift come, tell them no. Millions of people got together the day after he was inaugurated to tell him no. So if you're looking for something to do this week as an act of resistance, pick up your phone, call your senator, call your congressman, and tell them the following. I am not comfortable with Steve Bannon representing me or anyone else on the National Security Council. I'm not comfortable with it. You shouldn't be comfortable with it. And if we do end up marching to war one of these days, one thing that no one is going to be able to say is, well, I didn't know. Because it's not going to be a surprise when you put in people like this in charge of matters pertaining to life and death in wars around the world. It's not a surprise. And you do have to tell your representatives that you're not comfortable. And when it comes time for them to vote on war, you have to tell them no. You have to do it strenuously. And I'm speaking to veterans that might be listening. You need to tell them why. Because you're the ones who know. Oh, absolutely. I think veterans should be the ones leading this part of the resistance movement. Uh, Veterans are the ones who know the cost of war. What the hell do I know? And so for the people that have seen it, who have actually been to war, what goes through your mind when you hear President Trump make a statement that he loves war or that he's all in favor of it or that they're ready to rock and roll and kick some ass? I don't think somebody who's actually been to war is going to have a positive response to that kind of idle chatter. Because you have had the experience. Maybe for some of you it was great. The veterans I know, it wasn't. Many of them have come back physically and or mentally damaged. There are no unwounded soldiers in warfare. Nobody escapes unscathed. And if you've already been through it, you have to let them know what it's really like because the people who usually beat the drum the loudest particularly in the republican party are the ones who have no idea what it means they get all hard whenever the military comes up they get all excited about how awesome it must be to fire a gun or drop a bomb fly a fighter jet they don't know and they don't care because to them it's fucking call of duty it's a fucking video game the difference is the people who are doing the shooting the people who are doing the flying the people that are doing the bombing are actual human beings and there's no fucking reset when your guy dies you don't get to start over again when you fucking die in their little call of duty game you're dead for real and you're dead forever and your buddies are dead forever and your children are going to be without a parent or in some cases two and it's not just the people who are in the war itself who will suffer their loved ones will suffer when they come back broken their loved ones will suffer when they're gone for years at a time, when they're out of communication, when you have no idea from moment to moment if they're alive or dead, if you have to keep the house going and keep the house payments going and figure out what happens when the refrigerator dies because the person who normally takes care of it is somewhere overseas trying not to die themselves. You cannot let this fucking idiot do this to us again. We're already still entrenched in wars started by an idiot who didn't know what he was doing, didn't care, and didn't have any real experience. We don't need more of them. If there is any consolation, as we explained earlier, the protests are working. They are getting to Trump. They are getting to his administration. Our voices are being heard, and you need to continue to call your senators, call your congressmen, and let them know that this is not okay. And so until next time, organize, mobilize, protest, vote!